Uh, right now, I'd like to invite our, our wonderful Dean, um, Dr. Alana Lindgren, Dean of Fine Arts, up to the podium to introduce our next speaker, our Orion visiting uh, scholar who is here with us this afternoon. And we're very grateful to the Faculty of Fine Arts and to um, Dr. Lindgren for supporting um, the speaker uh, series and supporting our guest today and for all the support you've provided for this event in general. So thank you, uh, Alain, if you'd like to come up and introduce our, um, our next speaker. I always have to do this when I speak. <laughs> I always say I'm the right size and history and demographics support me, uh, particularly if you include the Middle Ages and earlier. Um, but thank you very much, Erin, and uh, thanks to Carolyn for the invitation to, to speak today. Uh, the Orion Fund uh, is uh, uh, an endowed fund in the Faculty of Fine Arts that allows us to bring leading scholars and artists to talk to us about their work and to help us connect with um, them and their institutions and their their work. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share that with you and that we have this endowed fund. I would also like to voice my respect for the Lekwungen, the Songhees and Esquimalt peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and the Lekwungen and Wasainich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day and I say that as someone who is not, uh, who is a settler and not originally from these lands, but every day I express my gratitude for the ability to be on these lands, near these waters, and also with this weather, I really love rain. And um, it is, I, it, it's, it's um, very important to me, so I'm very grateful to that every day. I'm also very honored to uh, introduce to you our, our next speaker. Dr. Alice Ming Wei Jim is an art historian and curator based in Montreal. She currently is Concordia University Research Chair in Critical Curatorial Studies and Decolonizing Art Institutions and founding editor-in-chief of the journal Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures and the Americas, published by Brill with Concordia University and New York University. Jim has galvanized a new generation of students and scholars in the study of ethnocultural art histories that extends to, the cura to, extends to curatorial studies and critical race museology. Focusing primarily on contemporary Asian Canadian and Black Canadian artists, Jim has curated exhibitions over of over 50 artists of color and indigenous artists and organized major scholarly events within academic settings and for the broader arts community in Canada and internationally. She has also been involved in a leadership capacity in several, former, in several formal partnerships involving international networking and community building initiatives with a strong commitment to research and social justice. Previously, Concordia University Research Chair in Ethnocultural Art Histories from 2017 to 2022, Jim's research on diasporic art in Canada and contemporary Asian art has generated new dialogues within and between ethnocultural and global art histories, critical race theory, media arts, and curatorial studies. In 2019, she co-convened co the New York University Global Asia Pacific Art Exchange, GAX 2019, Jojage, Montreal, Asian Indigenous Relations in Contemporary Art on the theme of curatorial hospitality. Jim is also a co-investigator of the Shirk Transatlantic Platform Project, Worlding Public Cultures, and a collaborator on the Shirk Partnership Grant thinking through the museum. Her current Shirk funded project examines Afrofuturism and Black Lives Matter in the Canadian art scene. Recent projects include the WPC 2023 Worlding Jojage Montreal Bridging Knowledges, Practices and Beings Conference at Concordia University about how global, transnational, and transcultural public narratives are being represented 
in universities, museums, and other spaces of art and culture, focusing on the unique art ecology of Montreal. Jim is a member of the College of New Scholars of the Royal Society of Canada and recipient in 2022 of UAAC's inaugural award for the advancement of equity, diversity, and inclusion and accessibility. Her talk today is Curating in Crisis, Been in Bronzes to Extreme Weather. Please welcome Dr. Jim. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindgren, for that generous introduction that you all so kindly um, and patiently listened to. And so, yes, uh, I just need to be in here. So, I also want to thank Caroline for inviting me here and also the Orion Visiting Scholar Fund for. Um, the invitation to be part of this very rich program. And I am um, deeply honored to be here. So I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging and paying respects to the Lekwungen peoples, the Songhees, the Esquimalt nations, the custodians on whose traditional territories I am grateful to be a guest this week. I was born and I live in Jajage, Montreal, on the unceded lands of the Gagnon-Gahaga Nation in the French-speaking province of Quebec. I use she, her pronouns, and identify as an uninvited, English-speaking, linguistic minority and racialized, visible minority, arrivant settler of southern Chinese ancestry. My parents left another Victoria Harbor and British settler colony across the Pacific during a time of tear gas, riots, and civil unrest to eke out a better life in what is now known as Canada. And for that and so much more, I am grateful. So the idea for the topic of my talk today started a while ago. And a while ago, we mean pre-COVID, with some thoughts that I had uh, in trying to answer the question uh, with my colleague, um, University de Montréal, research chair in curatorial studies and practice, Marie Fraser. The question was, what is critical curating? The results of, uh, we, the results, our results were published in the winter 2017 issue of RICAR. And it had, um, started with its premise as, um, with the premise that curatorial practice is distinct from curatorial critique or critical curating, a term that has been around since the late 1960s shift in the role of the curator from custodian of a privately owned collection to exhibition making as institutional critique. So back in 2017, Marie and I had boldly stated, quote, if curating constitutes itself as a discourse, it is because it implies a consciousness of its own conditions of possibility and of the artistic, theoretical, social, and institutional issues at play. Canadian and Indigenous scholars have been crucial in shaping the emergent field of curatorial studies, leading discussions that work towards the project of decolonizing world-making practices and challenge the disciplines of art history and museum studies, long bastions of the dominant colonial knowledge. And so I really want to thank also De Anne for, um, uh, for your uh, very rich, um, uh, uh, rich uh, presentation, because it's a really great context for a lot of what I'm going to be discussing. And um, what, uh, what I wanted to sort of preface, and I might not uh, be able to uh, fully uh, present every aspect of what I prepared is to actually reserve some room to um, uh, to respect um, the work of racialized communities of the last semester semester and I mean last last fall which has been hugely so such a devastating time for so many of us and I mean I think um, uh, you know um, 
just psychologically speaking and, and, and just like in terms of um, uh, being shaken, being shaken um, from where you're standing. And so I, I just want to reserve some space for um, a respect for dark capacities. And I think a, a politics of refusal, which you'll find sort of running through uh, some of the the ways in which I'm trying to express things that um, may or may not be able to land in 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 a place that um, is comfortable for everyone. Um, and so, so just to just to mention that this paper is of course a, a part of a lot lar larger project um, and has many many different tales. And so I'm going to present it almost as a performative gesture. Uh, as in terms of as a, a lecture performance as well. So I'm going to try my best and see how, how it goes. I know I have uh, uh, some flexibility with time, so I really appreciate your the generous uh, time slot that is given here. Okay, so uh, within three years since uh, Marie and I wrote that in 2017, Weathering the double pandemic of white supremacy and COVID-19 that raged on at the same time as dealing with complex, continuous collective and colonial trauma, and all this amid the devastating planetary effects of climate change has constitutively become the defining interconnected crises of the 21st century. It is the condition at this nexus that I want to conjure up when I say extreme weather. Of course, with a huge nod to Christina Sharp and her must-read 2016 book, The Wake on Blackness and Being, Sharp positions the weather as a lens to understand the inescapable conditions within the afterlife of slavery. So not only do you have climate change extreme weather causing smog, AKA ozone pollution, so thick it takes your breath away, but you also have anti-black, breathtaking violence and toxic smoke-filled air and planet warming emissions from exploding bombs and rockets and artillery in regions of war and conflict. Not to mention the tempestuous ordeal faced by institutions in their efforts to address either or any of the above beyond tokenistic gestures. In the wake of the deadly viral outbreak, the, the beginning of the 2020s didn't need to go far to see an upsurge of new and pre-existing anti-Black and anti-Asian racism, as well as a heightened racial violence and discrimination against other ethnically diverse groups. Never having disappeared, white nationalism returned to Occidental mainstream politics in the late 2010s with a vengeance of renewed nativism, extremism, Islamophobia, and anti-immigrant animus. By May 2020, yet another police murder of black life occurred in the U.S., that of 46-year-old George Floyd in Minneapolis. But this time, a video recording of it went viral on social media and sparked unprecedented national protest demonstrations against anti-black policing and brutality, reform, defund, or abolish. While at the same time, amplified hashtag Black Lives Matter, indigenous voices, and other social justice movements with a similar message, decolonize institutions, dismantle systemic racism. For the art world, demands increased worldwide to decolonize a paradigmatic art institution, the museum. University campuses, those that weren't shuttered, became central hubs for the politicization of a new generation of students, many who had started their tertiary education on Zoom and for whom it would be their first time engaging in activism, which needs to be tenacious to make change. In 2022, the International Council of Museums, ICOM, established in 1946, updated its 27 definition of a museum to recognize the importance of diversity, accessibility, inclusivity, sorry, ethics, sustainability, and community participation. None of these terms were in the original definition of 2007. This overdue revision underscored the changing role of museums in accounting to the diverse publics they serve, and in effect charges institutions to implement better practices 
informed by principles of equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, EDIA. Importantly, ICOM's museum, ICOM's museum redefinition and its consultative process called immediate attention to, among many other actionable items, the urgent increasing need for curators to have theoretical knowledge and practical experience in analyzing and decolonizing art institutions. The scope and makeup of this relatively new set of expertise are that which presumably established career curators and cultural managers do not have at their disposal, but are obligated to either acquire or source if the institution seeks to represent itself as at least respectfully not racist, even if they are not interested in decolonization. So I think you know who I'm quoting. Um, <laughs> Often, this virtually impossible institutional overhaul fails upon the shoulder, falls, not fails, falls upon the shoulder of the token soul new quote, Black Lives Matter hire to fix. Indeed, how are BIPOC curators and artists responding to and recovering from this crise du jour? And for much more robust art ecological systems in larger urban centers, for example, Apart from museums, how are other kinds of art institutions, galleries, artist-run centers, community spaces implicated in these transformations or mainstream institutional deficits? What we are seeing in these times of crisis, time and time again, from Documenta 14, 15, and 16, to somewhere in downtown Toronto, is that on the one hand, the critique of institutions is an undertaking that seems possible these days, regardless it be by the so-called freelance um, or independent star curator or institutional career staff curator. On the other hand, in environments of political and environmental, oops, in, in, in environments of political and economic forces that resist radicality, the two positions are equally susceptible to board predilections and job precarity. There are, of course, other preemptive measures that ensure criticality cannot be sustained or at least is curbed side. Just to be clear, to take the art world seriously, we must see how in the current political climate, critical curating is in crisis. The art ecology of this place we now know as Canada is sick, very, very sick. Years from now, when and if we would be so fortunate to be looking back to this present falling apart before our eyes, what will have been our lessons learned from their impact on critical curating of the social justice movements, decolonizing methodologies, the emerging field of critical race mu museology these few years? Out of crisis spanning environmental devastation, educational censorship, and the end of affirmative action, right-wing and populist uprisings, resurgent militarisms and genocide, latent religious antagonisms. What role can critical race museology or critical curatorial studies play as an academic and a political project? One of the ways I have been tackling this or coping with this, perhaps too. This is to consider the following. How might new perspectives emerge if we understand a politics of breath as the necessary functionality of critical curatorial practice of an else when? If we considered everything and everyone in a gallery as being in relation, taking turns holding space for one another, literally giving breathing room to express, open up, and simply be present. What if we went about exhibition making as regiment and movement, living and breathing, not just to survive? By the way, I don't have a complete answer. I don't, might not even have an answer, just a few hacks. So hack one against this current tide of toxicity, the shift from critique to crisis is to recognize it. Five truisms. A worldwide pandemic hits hardest those most systemically disadvantaged. A global racial reckoning that wasn't, but a white lie. 
The threat of nuclear war exposes a racial empathy gap in the refugee crisis. Among impacts of historical and ongoing settler colonialism in and on different fields in contestation are generations lost and entire peoples calamitized by the emergency of ongoing divisive geopolitical conflict and occupation. Toxic rivers and oceans teem with plastic. Rising sea levels and a warming planet are sinking nations of water and the consciousness of Earth with it, showing signs of extolled glissantian rural mentality, strained, stretched, trembling. Let's start with the premise that curating is in crisis precisely because curating today is to curate crisis while always already in crisis. Coping with acute crisis, crises on top of slow burning crises, such as structural racism, protracted warfare, or climate change. How do we curate the public culture's domains and the undercommons that have changed, shifted, pivoted, or amid doing so, i.e. in crisis mode? So this is breathing in five hacks. We might start by taking a deep breath all the way down, expanding your belly and release. I invite us to take a pause. Give yourself a little breathing room. Take time to breathe in and out. Karen Barard writes about how, quote, the possibility for what the world may become calls out in the pause that precedes each breath before the moment comes into being and the world is remade again. In Breathing Aesthetics, Jean-Thomas Tremblay begins by bluntly pointing out that to be a breather is to be vulnerable. It is our existential condition as humans, becoming conscious of our breathing confronts us with finite, our finitude. The thing, of course, is that we are all breathers. We don't really have the choice of not being one, biologically speaking. And in this, vulnerability has been exploited more so than it has been mobilized. For instance, there have been more capitalization than empowerment on and by social media of vulnerability. Yet we also know full well that, as Shilin Membe reminds us, some breathers, some lives, some life can breathe easier than others. Despite that which we, including all the species of Earth, supposedly hold in common, which is the universal right to breathe. Even this is facing depletion of our own device. In contrast, Coming at this from another direction is the great Caribbean Canadian poet, M. Norbasi Philip, writing about the poetics of breath. Philip reminds us of the intimate relationship between prepos prepositional breathing or breathe for and holding space for others to create conditions that oops, creates that not only for, our, our, for other people's survival, but also for their thrivance. She writes this is the gap, the gasp for air that every mother breathes in for the unborn baby. And in this poem, she writes, she, we all begin life in water. We all begin life because someone breathed for us until we breathe for ourselves. Someone breathes for us. Everyone has had someone, a woman, breathe for them until that first gap, until that first gasp for air. These lines open Philip's essay about the mnemonic turn of the 1950s, in the 1950s, from a Black feminist perspective and the respirational poetics that embeds the precarity of uh, African-American breath. Published in 2018, its title, The Gap, or Gasp, depending on how you read it, has a letter S in brackets and so stays on the space or on the gap between the two graphemes, that's the S and the P, that blend together with the G and the A to mean sudden or convulsive exhalation, often through the mouth, or paralinguistic respiration, according to the OED. 
Philip asked us here, who or what do you breathe for? On March 30th, 2020, uh, Philip posted a, a scanned copy of this 2018 essay with but one word, gasp, in the title. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic on March 11th. A few days after the black death spectacle of Floyd's murder went viral, on June 9th, 2020, I received in my inbox the latest in the Hemi Press Contacto series, series, an essay by the famed scholar of decolonial travel writing, Mary Louise Pratt, asking if it was uncanny or overdetermined that the two epic e events that had upheaved the US and the world were both about suffocation. Referring to, of course, the pandemic and quote, the public spectacles with blocked airways as an instrument of racial terror from lynchings to chokeholds. To be sure, as Katerina Albano writes in her book, Led Essay, Out of Breath, while the body's most essential elements, the breath and our respiratory system are the primary, tar primary targets of the COVID-19 virus, they are also the site of transgression, violence and oppression that catalyze in an uprising for racial justice that has not been seen in a generation. In a way, this is the context of the activism, uh, the history of activism that took place in 2021 um, that um, and um, paper was, um, was referring to. Um, so what I wanted to add to this was that parenthetically, it is well known that thousands more non-Black protesters took to the streets to join these demonstrations in summer 2020, not simply out of moral outrage because Black Lives Matter, but because they had had enough and wanted the racial terror happening in their cities to stop, period. Pratt goes on to bring to the foray um, the twisty nature of suffocating wildfires and air pollution, both subject to political geography of the titular essay's title, Airways, the Politics of Breath. The essay was reprinted as a coda of her 19th or 20th book, I wasn't sure, Planetary Longings, published by Duke University in 2022. And I have a coda too later if we get, if we have time. So recently I have been looking for more room to breathe. The, there are rooms that breathe, rooms that take our breath away, and rooms in which we can finally breathe easily. Hack two. Philip's poetic, poetics of breath takes me to another place, underwater. True story. Philip's essay, The Gasp, was published 10 years after her 2008 genre-breaking book-length poem titled Zong, which consists of words torn from a legal document about a massacre on the slave ship Zong en route from Accra to Jamaica. In 1781, some 130 slaves, enslaved Africans were thrown overboard so that the ship owners could collect insurance money on lost cargo, a murderous practice tragically not uncommon in the history of the transatlantic slave trade. New Jersey-based Caribbean-American artist Sandra Perry's 2018 multi-channel seamless video projection, Typhoon Coming On, obviously riffs off of J.M.W. Turner's uh, famous 1840 romantic painting, Slave Ship, or slave sh Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying, Typhoon Coming On. This could well have been the Zong. Perry's work is an ocean memorial to the 1.8 Africans who died in the Atlantic. Ah, but did they? This immersive and watery surround brings us to the mythical Drexia, an underwater world created by the Detroit-based 1990s uh, te techno-musician duo James Stinson and Gerald, Gerald Donald, and taken up by numerous other Afrofuturist artists, including Ellen Gallagher on Wenge Chimutu, and currently by Ayana Jackson at the Smithsonian, which you see here. Drexia is... Um, is inhabited by Drexians who trace their lineage back to the pregnant 
African women who were thrown off slave ships to drown, but instead their babies swam out of their wombs, able to breathe without air, giving rise to an empire of sea underwater. I think of the, con the context and contrast of this pre-COVID breath work by Philip and Perry to when by the end of 2020, it felt like our societal moment was defined by these three words. Experiences before the end of life, agonal respiration sets in when the gasping breath Oops, when the gasping breaths appear uncomfortable and raise concern that the patient is suffering and in agony. There might have been a glimmer of hope at one point, but January 6th on Capitol Hill in 20, um, 20, 20, 2021 and October 7th this past year pretty much trampled out whatever little hope there was, for me anyway. Breathlessness in this weather remains a critical state of emergency. Con con concomitantly, back in business, institutions and companies fell all over themselves to embrace black causes. Some actions were gestures that cost nothing. Museum content strategies um, pledged to increase their programming for, by, and about black people. Many institutions made pledges to diversify hiring, especially in their executive ranks. But compounded by the pol polarized tensions Concerning the current political situation in the Middle East, little progress on these pledges and other commitments to decolonize, open discussion, open dialogue, and transformation have come to um, bear to uh, bear fruit. And if a year ago I might have said that we are in fact bracing in, anticip in anticipation of the backlash politics, I take it back. The cultural lag has caught up with the performative curating, which in turn stalled out agonistic curating, perhaps in ways such that we might not see the latter again in the foreseeable future. We're coping with the fallout resulting from the unresponsiveness of our institutions from government to cultural sectors to calls for accountability, open dialogue, and real change. This is what makes a room like this one filled with flow and resilience so resonating and sacred. It remembers, it grieves, it takes you in, in a soft embrace kind of way, and it lives in a way. This is an installation some of you might have seen um, in, uh, in Vancouver. It was shown at the Vancouver Art Gallery the last time I visited in DC. Um, simply titled Breathe, it is a work by the venerable Black Canadian artist um, Jan Wade made from multiple panels of leftover cloth and threads that she stitched together bit by bit for more for over for over a decade. Quote, I want these patterns to flow together. I want them to have movement. In 2014, when Eric Garneau, uh, sorry, Garneau, Eric Gardner was chokehold to death by police gasping, I can't breathe. Jan Wade dedicated this piece to him, and from then on, thought of these pieces as breathing, as breath itself. The actual breathing, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to flip some slides. Um, this is the detail of the work. These are uh, textile panels. Pretty, oops. The actual breathing of senior black artists and local community members from Victoria-based Charles Campbell's intimate 45-minute multimedia installation titled Black Breath Spectacle the, um, is the actual breathing of senior Black artists and local community members. Um, the expression Black Death Spectacle was popularized by the performance artist Parker Bright during the Whitney Biennial showing of Dana Schultz's controversial painting of the open casket funeral of the mutilated course of Emmett Till, the 14-year-old black boy murdered in 1955 after it was falsely claimed that he flirted with a white woman. For their performance, Bright stood in front of the painting, blocking visitors' views of it for up to four hours a day, wearing a t-shirt that they had written on in the front, 
no lynch mob, and in the back, more often seen in media, black death spectacle. Instead of showing the fungibility of black bodies, Bright wanted to confront people, quote, with a living, breathing black body. Similarly, putting the force on the focus on breath rather than death, Campbell's installation invites audiences to immerse themselves in the sounds of breath and breathing, and imagine being present with a loved one from their past. The sounds are taken from a performance by 20 Black artists and curators roaming around Vancouver Art Gallery in 2021, and a recording. Reflecting on power, vulnerability, and oppression, the performance turned the act of breathing into a, a comment on the poor representation or poor image after Etho Stero of Black people in art institutions and beyond. I'm gonna do a time check. Woo, okay, that, that's good, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so the frequencies of these uh, recorded breaths are shown on the monitors as spectrograms. You see here, visualizing the audio waves, um, audio waves. Rooms like that by Jan Wade, um, um, Jan Wade and Charles Campbell bring into reawaken an act of the Black Breath Archive in spaces that have historically relegated so-called non-Western, non-white culture to ethnographic displays of non-living object objects or otherwise not collected. And so now I'm going to take an intermission with, between the five, um, the, the last two acts and the next, uh, next uh, two or three. And I'm going to make a transition. So of interest here is um, a slight but notable shift from breathing rooms as a place of refuge or to take a break and rooms that breathe to rooms specifically for breathing. The idea that museums can serve a restorative function to be a place of refuge or have well-being uh, benefits for their visitors has been around for quite a while, but in the immediate post-COVID years, um, this past year included, not surprisingly, this attitude has experienced a big uptake along with more studies on the role of museums in enhancing societal psychological well-being. There are also conferences. The Third International Museum's Health and Wellbeing Summit online, in fact, starts in two days. So more than tourist destinations or centers of uh, learning, uh, we expect museums to be, today to be experience hubs and places of self-improvement apart from its traditional pedagogical role. Museums are heeding the call. Um, they are self-promoting how they are caring, restorative environments that enhance your health and well-being, as well as spark curiosity and connect us to humanity. Museums have become therapeutic. They have become places for human flourishing, spaces of healing, reparations, repair, in addition to being platforms and spaces that affirm not only the presence, but also contributions of diverse cultural communities. This is the aspiration of the promotion. So, of course, this tends to bring us around to the question, well, what do the objects think about this? And what if these objects are in fact not objects, but belongings or spirits or spirit guides? Has anyone asked, thought to ask these spirits or the owners of these belongings what they think? And here, hat tip to Heather here, nowhere is this a more exemplary case than that of the Kamayork Museum of Contemporary Inuit Art at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Um, of how a museum can care for works, each of which has a spirit so that their stories and the stories of the artists can continue to be shared for generations to come. From regularly, hold, regularly holding ceremony and prayers in the vaults to the inclusion of testimonials or interactive items that can be touched and using display cases that include ventilation holes for the living spirits to breathe easily or for when they need a break altogether. So I'm really grateful and humbled that Heather's here um, in the house, because uh, if you need to know uh, more information about this amazing museum, <laughs> he's the person to ask, uh, the expert here. 
Um, but for now, what I'm going to do is contrast that exemplar um, to uh, what we uh, re might recognize as a very uh, well-known scene from the 2018 blockbuster movie um, Black Panther, um, where we're clearly in the um, African section of a fictional museum. How many of you have seen this movie? Because sometimes people haven't seen the movie. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's, of course, the scene where the bad guy, Killmonger, is casing the joint, right? And um, almost um, immediately, the audiences, that's us, right, can already recognize different uh, power uh, differentials that are at play. Uh, for example, he's being actually surveyed by the security guards. So, so the policing, his presence as a minority is obviously unwelcome the minute he walks in. Um, and uh, when the curator, the white um, book knowledge curator, uh, uh, comes in, automatically um, the um, ancestral knowledge that he has been uh, able to uh, to uh, inherit is, uh, is, is condescended to. Um, by this white curator expert with um, their academic knowledge in African studies. So it's also, I wanted also to think about the questions that he asked, which are actually very uh, uh, in, um, incisive, right? How do you think your ancestors got these objects? He asked the curator. Did they pay a fair price or did they take it as if, like they took everything else? And these last, so these next last two rooms that I want to visit with you um, bring, for me, bring breath and breathing to bear in the lives of the artworks themselves. And so here you see a performance, derivation of a performance by Kenyan and Indian uh, Canadian artist Brendan Fernandez, who has long been engaging with living masks from the continent, including wooden masks from uh, Burkina Faso, Congo, uh, Cameroon, and Nigeria, um, in, in various um, museum um, collections of African, um, uh, African art and culture, raising questions about authorship, authenticity, post-colonial histories, performance, and identity in relationship to how museums collect and display African objects in quotations. In this performance at the Seattle Art Museum titled In Touch, Fernandez has invited a professional dancer to engage with two, ma uh, two masks up close and personal uh, to the point that um, the, it, it, uh, the, the action that the performer takes, which is to like wildly gesture and point confrontationally at the masks very closely, um, would probably get uh, this, this person kicked out of the museum, <laughs> hauled off by a security guard. Um, but in, in this case, obviously, they were warned, warned ahead of time. Um, and in you know, the, the performance was very much about trying to question what um, what kind of controls are in place for uh, museum museum displays of um, uh, in this case uh, African artifacts and uh, how what does it mean to act um, poorly or misbehave within the conventions of the museum, regardless whether or not this, these kinds of actions or relations that are being performed by, by, um, by visitors may have actually been expected or the, 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 the protocol to um, engage with these works of art in their original, uh, for their original uh, purpose, right? And so um, the artist has created this chance for audiences to have this odd encounter um, with someone who uh, dressed um, in costumes of, of the Louis the the thirteenth or the twelfth um, sort of uh, Leve style white shirt um, is automatically, obviously, and also as a black performer, audience automatically seen as someone who doesn't necessarily um, is seen to belong in the museum as at least um, a, a, a visitor. Um, and also interacting with the work that, and I quote, with, um, oh, he's interacting with bells on, literally on, on their ankles, um, in their performance, um, that transforms the, the performer into a masquerader who dances to reunite masks with body and the movements that they haven't 
seen due to the many years of confinement on museum pedestals. And so the person of interest here is actually the mass that is living and that is being uh, reactivated and regenerated and revived, if you will. So significantly, these masks that are actually of uh, uh, very carefully selected. One it is interestingly a mass that is usually done by an historian of, of uh, from the um, from the uh, 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 from the community. There are two different uh, African uh, communities um, whose work, uh, whose masks are being uh, um, engaged with, and uh, and so we have this. Uh, I think the presence for me also calls into question my role as a historian, uh, um, engaging and and understanding uh, this work, um, and. So I thought this was an example. There are many other examples that are trying to reignite uh, or visit um, objects that um, um, and to uh, raise awareness of the uh, original intents and purposes of their um, of their being, uh, other than simply as sort of dead um, artifacts from the past that have been um, accumulated through the. Uh, through, for example, uh, looting um, in uh, colonial times. And so we could think of the examples um, from Berlin-based uh, Cateratia's Repair, which was um, popularly seen at uh, Documenta 13, but also at Power Plant, um, closer to home. Um, and, oh, here's, a, here's a one, another installation. And I'm showing shots where you're seeing, um, uh, first, the, uh, the uh, the uh, objects or belongings um, that are on shelves, and then as uh, as um, as I'm exploring these um, these different ways of installing um, these works and 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 um, welcoming engagements with it closer and closer. So now you have the masks that are now sort of almost um, at your uh, at your life life. Uh, sort of a human scale to human scale, and you're engaging them with a different way. And you also have the work um, that was featured um, in the 2021 exhibition called Open Mouse that's curated by Kanita Lilla, who's the associate curator of the uh, Land Collection of Arts of Africa in at the Agnes uh, Etherington uh, Gallery. And uh, this gallery, uh, this collection of Arts of Africa actually has one of the um, most comprehensive collections of African objects in Canada, in Kingston. And so for, for it, to have a, a curator dedicated to this, and what Kanita has done is actually uh, commissioned a contemporary artist to engage um, and uh, with the works in the collection and to reinstall it in this way. And I think that here already the ways that um, um, the, the, these works are being presented with objects that are already in collections, right? Um, sort of begs the question, well, how are this installation, how is this installation, if ever, is it gonna be collected? Because you have like many, many different layers of collections to, uh, uh, of, um, of um, uh, well, I just wanna use the word permission to, be, to think of it at least, right? Okay, so now I am going to do a, So, one fifteen, right? I have six minutes. Okay, <laughs> my rules. Okay, now this, uh, this, this, um, the, 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 the addition of uh, ceremony and um, also care by um, elders in the community add another layer to ways in which, you know, an installation project might be collected. So, so uh, in, the, in the case of the line collection, when it was moved, it was actually, um, it, it had a performance aspect to it. And so this becomes part of that which is collected, but that might not be actually something very tangible. Now, what I'm gonna do is flip is now, of course, um, when we're talking about restitution and repair, more often than not, we're not talking about these local smaller collections, right? We are all like um, fixated now um, for a couple, for a few years now on uh, the case of the Benin bronzes, which, as you know, it refers to over four thousand pieces that um, that span. They're not just bronze pieces; they're also carved wood and ivory objects that were actually stolen by the British Army. Um, 
during the 1897 looting of uh, uh, Benin City from uh, various ancestral shrines, including the very important one uh, of the uh, royal, uh, the royal palace the, uh, of the Oba. And Nigeria has repeatedly called for the reparations of the Benin bronzes since the 1960s, which is when they gained independence, of course. Um, and um, more recently, post-COVID, or almost post-COVID, I was in, uh, in Heidelberg uh, in July 2020, uh, 2022, when it was just announced that Germany would return the Benin bronzes. And this would be a landmark announcement because that Germany would be the first European country to actually restitute Benin bronzes um, as soon as 2022. And this has already begun. And of the 160 institutions, the British Museum has the largest numbers of the name bronzes, um, around 950 approximately. And the museum with the second uh, largest collection is actually in Germany. And so, uh, and, and that's roughly half of it, uh, half of that number around 500, just over 500, right? And so when we, when I was a uh, part of a research team about world and public cultures, um, we were visiting uh, with Monica Juneja, who is a professor and uh, uh, research chair in global art histories at the University of Heidelberg, uh, who is in partnership with the Dresden State Art Collections, which actually uh, one of their collections is, is was, <laughs> was uh, the five Benin bronzes. And what I wanted to um, bring in as almost a case study that for you to, um, to sort of mull over is the work, the the intervention uh, of the work that um, by Emeka, uh, Emeka Ogbo, who is a, a Berlin Nigerian artist, um, who has been um, is well known for his uh, interventions uh, in uh, in on bus shelters all throughout um, uh, Berlin, especially that are calling for the restitution of the Benin bronzes, particularly those, of course, in in, in Germany. And uh, he was invited to do a, a commission to do a work that would respond to not only uh, the the history of the presence, however it got there, to the German uh, museum, um, well, this particular one in Dresden, but also to think about what its absence would be like. And this is what he uh, uh, produced. So when we, when we went there, it was just happening. And so it was the weirdest thing because you had a door with a double doors and it just says um, a, a very simple small sign like this on the door saying, okay, well, uh, it's just been announced that we're returning the bed and brothers that we just, it, it, it was in German. So I'm a little, it, it just sort of say, hold on for more, like it, it was so unsure of itself. It didn't really know what to do, right? And then in the next space after, it's almost like this one, uh, we had a very darkened room where you would actually find these light box photographs that are larger than life of the bed and because they're not to scale, um, they're much larger. And you would walk in and you would engage with these ghostly photographic images of these pieces. So. What was interesting for us was that, you know, on the one hand that they're taken away so that they, they're lie, they're, they're, they are being respected, these bronzes. But yet at the same time, it has, uh, the museum has provided a surrogate via this artist's work who obviously is going to make a very important livelihood from the, the series, which has been well sold because now it documents the presence of those burning bronzes, but at the same time also capitalizes up or the, and exploits the very reason why they were taken down and, and, and shattered in a, and behind closed doors in the first place. And so there was this irony here. And um, I think that this put us as international um, curators and art historians in a very awkward place uh, to need to comment to the State Museum. Um, <laughs> look what I did. Look about what they did, you know, because they wanted to know our uh, reflections. And so I thought that this was very strange because and perhaps important for us to bring to bear here, because if we think about the ways in which, um, um, how we're trying to uh, rehang or reinstall or, or work with collections in ways that respect um, the original purposes of, or even uh, the spaces uh, uh, of these um, objects of uh, belongings, one originally categorized it, oh, this is a room of 
what it was shown in. It toured all the uh, various state collection museums in Germany. Um, this is one um, uh, of it when it was in uh, Leipzig. So if it originally, just before it was uh, uh, taken away from um, Benin, uh, would have been sort of in these placements, um, and yet we're much more familiar with the hang at the British um, Museum here, then I just wonder, somewhere in between this, this, and what it was like in 1971, there's a huge disjuncture, and I'm sure someone could write a PhD or two um, about it. So there you go, here's a topic. Um, and uh, <laughs> so I, uh, I'm just really intrigued by that, but also the problematics, of course, about the hang in the collection. And um, I don't think I, I'm going to um, um, talk about uh, the the ways in which uh, the the museums are going. Um, that the Nigeria has been trying to uh, find spaces that are up to museum standards in order to house those uh, uh, bronzes or those treasures that come back in appropriate climate controlled ways. Um, and in fact, they have been building a museum just for that with state-of-the-art um, um, facilities to do this. And what I wanted to link and, um, up to and come back to, and this would be my final hack, is um, how it's all so much about control. And in this case, it's about climate control. And so I wanted to make um, a transition from, from the ways that um, it's, it's not a coincidence that curating in crisis has led to this moment in time when just as museums are expanding care capacities to include climate controlled rooms so that cultural treasures, be they belongings or spirits within, can finally return home and breathe again, we are also confronted by how in fact humanity has entirely lost control of climate on an unprecedented planetary um, scale. And so everything is connected. And so for this final hack, I wanted to, to return to the taxonomy of breathing and how everyone and everything has a right to breathe. Um, and um, um, how everything is, in fact, uh, connected. And this is a work, oops, sorry. This is a work by a, a collector called the Taxonomy of Reading and where they map all the convergences of, of the, of uh, all these historical and current, uh, actuality affairs in the, the world happening right now with a single common denominator of breath. And everything is connected. And, um, I wanted to sort of think about how, um, that uh, in itself is uh, speaking volumes to how breathing is a functionality of our interlocking uh, fates. And it's also inarguably breathing that is dependent on our climate futures and extreme weather in the torrid zone. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Such a rich, poetic, deeply thoughtful, and ironic talk for these times. So thank you so much for teasing that out. I hope we'll hear more at the roundtable on these ideas. Very fertile territory. And as you say, a number of dissertation topics in there. Absolutely. As we go forward. Um, and so we're now going to turn to the question period. And I'm going to bring this. Um, microphone around as we ask questions because we are recorded and I would like to do that for the last session to facilitate all of it. So please do ask questions and then I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. 
saw that it, it's, it's a perfect question in many ways. <laughs> uh, and because I think one, one of the, um, I'm just going to go back to this, uh, this artist's intervention, right? One of the ways is that this is actually what he's done, right? He sort of uh, made a digital image file, right? Which, uh, he has additions he is selling, um, f uh, in additions of three. And so, and there's a series of them, like there were five and now there are seven. So I'm not sure how, how this, this could go up. There are 40,000, four, uh, 4,000 Benin bronzes all circulating in various museums across the world that are not in Ni Nigeria, right? So this could go along uh, for a long way. And in fact, this already is a com commencement of that, right? Um, but what's also, uh, another relevant project to, to, to delve into for, for your question is the, uh, the 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 existence of the um I forgot what it's called uh the digital Benin website right which they have actually did digitizing images that are tracking all of these uh, artifacts as they are being returned and so the 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 uh, import of this uh, website is actually that this is probably the only place that you will ever see all of these artifacts outside of Nigeria together in one place and to be able to be studied cross comp comparatively speaking, you know, like for different space, uh, and, and bringing, I mean, bridging huge distances of geographies around, right? So, yeah, so not just in terms of like the value of like how one can, um, cons preserve not conserve them forever, you know, but also to study them more in more depth. Yeah, great question. That stunned everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe um, just before that, and also I, I should add that, like in terms of sort of cultural cultural heritage, right? These these are these these really need to be done in consultation with um, with like in this case with with Nigeria and also the the government and the state and the museum, and there's a lot of debates and also negotiations around that too. Yes, I'm, I'm just constantly making <laughs> eye contact with Heather because... <laughs> Uh, the activism or the, um, the, uh, pedagogy? Okay, I, actually, I can try, uh, at both. Okay, so the reason why I'm, I'm sort of giving a, um, uh, a, a wink to, uh, Heather is also because before Heather came here, uh, we have in fact, um, piloted, a, um, a, a program that should be in the works, um, which is a graduate certificate in critical curatorial studies and practices. Um, it's a one-year program that will be um, started in fall 2025. And the focus actually, our, 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 uh, we call that, our, our um, approach uh, strategy or tactic has, has been to actually focus on this need, this gap that we need right now. Um, and, and, um, and, that um, emerging um, curators and also early career, uh, early career curators, but also curators of uh, whether the institutions, right, in the institutions who, who um, you know, may or not come out uh, during this time of um, critical race museology or colonial, yeah. So they may not have that. Uh, who are looking and starving and hungry for this knowledge. Um, and there's so many 
so many of us who can provide that knowledge in a way that is um, that is going to enable not just people who are wanting to work in institutions like the museums or, or in any other art spaces, right, for as a practitioner, but also for people who are already working in institutions who actually want to make that change and who want that door open somehow, you know. Um, and so maybe hopefully that this would um, this would uh, mess things up a bit and yeah, create some ground. A lot of universities have talked to their students to accelerate the movement and the practice You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, the confluence of everything that's been called yeah. this sort of turmoil in the world. And I'm just um, wondering what you think of your, where, where do you think that this is going to can I predict, it, predict the future? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think that might come up in our round table. <laughs> Right, I, 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 oh God, that's a big question. But like, um, yeah, I mean, museum futures, I think, is so intensely tied to um, a climate futures, right? Like the, the sustainability of our organizations, not just art in the art sector, but just generally speaking, all, all around the world, they are all going to have implications and trickle down effects on the ways in which we present art, which we make art, which we, and it brings into deep questioning of, you know, how can we actually collect and acquire works, you know, in this current climate? <laughs> yeah, so I, that's a big question, but I, that's definitely something to think of. Yeah, you're in the back there too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want to get the impression that I'm shaking any questions off. I think this is just a really big question. Um, but this one's a juicy one. Okay, so uh, uh, for me, I'll just recount it by anecdote. Um, you know, the irony of museums wanting to self-promote as caring institutions when um, the, the, what I had the, the occasion to experience was being in conversation with the director of um, this said museum um, who was reiterating the exact same um, phrase that um, the new director of the NGC was saying within two days apart um, and so I'm convinced that they had dinner or something, you know, <laughs> right? So I come in there, I can say, ah, oh, this is great. You know, I got, got this new chair and I'm really excited and I want you to be like a, a cultural institutional partner with, uh, with, uh, uh, for, to decolonize our institutions. And then I get this answer in public. So this is why I can share freely uh, it, to, to say, well, actually, no, I'm not interested in decolonization. So there you go. Present. They all have dinner together anyway. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if, take what you will from that. But I think that it's obvious that um, there's a lot of work that can be done, and we need to keep it keep it going, you know. Um, because that was really uncaring. That was uncaring on the students who were in the room. That was uncaring for me as a professional across down the street, because we're like down the street, art university from the museum, um, and just generally speaking, the entire like, yeah. Oh, really, I'm not going to go on this already, but like, absolutely, it was. Um, there's there's something, as I said, something very very sick going on here right now. There's an illness in there, and uh, you know, we we we. I mean, I'm never going to get. Um, I'm never going to be able to, to. I'm never going to be invited to speak at these institutions anyway or anymore, um, because because we need to actually call them out. But this, you know, like. It's obviously it's hard. It's it's really hard. It's a uh, it's a lot of politics in play. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, that is a great question, and thank you so much. I mean, there's so many different ways that uh, I can respond to it, and one of them is actually to think uh, think about well, um, you know, in terms of how museums can change and think in with them. Um, uh, and I'll just for shorthand, thinking about breathing as a functionality of um, the curatorial practice is to flip it around is that, well, may, maybe we need to think about how we want the, uh, the audiences of uh, the visitors of the museums to be changing, right? And so one of the things that I was in speaking with this the director of, um, of a Montreal Museum was that, um, that, you know, as a child, I grew up on that street. So as a child, that I would actually go to the museum and the security guard would be dogged, you know, because like, they're not used to seeing um, people of color in that museum. And, and this is a long time ago. So, um, right. But, and if we want that to change, then we're going to have to recognize that, that, um, um, uh, that if you want, if you want people to come, Right and engage with these these um, um, with the works and uh, cultures uh, cultural uh, objects with in a meaningful way. Right then we're going to also need to um, to uh, sorry I'm really tired um, to 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 be responsible right to be accountable to what um, um, community communities right communities also want their to see in their museums right. Um, yeah, that, did I answer your question? I love the uh, I love the question. Yeah. It's really also bringing in about community um, engagement as well. Well, apparently it's for the donors and the buyers and the <laughs> <laughs> hundreds a lot. I was paying attention. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll feel Thank you. Thanks for listening.